Good morning, boys and New Hope family. Hope this message finds you all well. Hope you're having a great day and a great week. We want to pick up our conversation where we left off last week. Um, so we'll be in Acts chapter 2 today. Last week we talked about Jesus' ascension, his command to the disciples to go and preach the gospel. We also spent a lot of time talking about how the believers at that time, those followers of Jesus, stayed together after Jesus' ascension. Um, and they were stayed in fellowship and prayer together as they went through this waiting time. So this we can pick up in chapter 2, and let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 13 in chapter 2. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. When what seemed to be, I'm sorry, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that spread and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment, as each one heard them speaking in his own language. Out of the maze, they asked, are, these not, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us hears them in his own native tongue? Parthians, Medes, Amalekites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Philogra and Pamphylia, Egypt and other parts of Libya near Syrian, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, Arabs, we all hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. So that's through verse 13. So this, of course, is the day of Pentecost. Um, so for two months, the disciples have seen Jesus entered Jerusalem. He, or they, two months ago, they saw Jesus enter Jerusalem. They saw him suffer, die, rise again. Since the last 40 days, according to Acts 1 3, the last 40 days on this earth appearing to his disciples and others. And now they've waited an additional 10 days. And that brings us to Pentecost, the 50th day. And see, they didn't know that this was the day the Holy Spirit was coming. They had no idea that God's outpouring would happen on this day we call Pentecost. But what's significant is that they were all together in one place still. The disciples were still gathered together, maintaining that same fellowship, that same sense of, of prayer, I imagine, being together in one place, still amazed at what God had done. But now God's Holy Spirit and God's promise has come to them in such a way that all men know the Holy Spirit has arrived. They know that these men are different. Uh, we read that when the Spirit came, they began to preach in languages not their own, and they were from Galilee, so they likely spoke Hebrew and Greek, or at least one of those two. But really, the people from all around the world were in Jerusalem, and these men spoke to them in the same language. The disciples said the glory of God and the amazement of what God had done, and each man heard him according to his own language. See, and so now why is that significant? And you know, I think about what the last command Jesus gave his disciples to go and tell others about Jesus, to share what he's done to be his witnesses. Now, it's hard to be a witness if you can't speak to somebody. See, after all, these disciples didn't have an evangel cube to show the plan of salvation. They had to use words to tell these folks. Um, so the people heard the Holy Spirit arrival, and they came to see what's going on. And when they came to see, they each heard their own languages being spoke by these disciples, these Galileans. Some were amazed, and some mocked them, saying they were drunk. And so you had both responses to this gospel being preached. Some were amazed by it, and some were mocked, or mocked as those by it. But let's read Peter's response. We'll read verses uh, 14 to 36. So a bit of a longer passage. Bear with me. 14 to 36. So we have Peter. He says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who are in Jerusalem, let me explain to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on earth below, blood and smoke, and I'm sorry, blood and fire and bills of smoke. The sun will return to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you as 
to you by miraculous by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said this about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Both my body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew God had promised him an oath that he would one that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool at my feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Thank you. That's verse 36. So Peter got up and addressed the, addressed the crowd. And this is the same Peter who was bold and brash and bragged that he would never fall away. He's the one that cut off the slaves here in the garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was arrested. St. Peter who denied knowing Christ and who Jesus later gave the charge to look after his church at the end of John. This is the Peter who addresses the crowd. He addressed the crowd with scripture, starting with the prophet Joel, moving on to the Psalms of David. In other words, Peter spoke the same language the crowd did. He used their background, their knowledge, to show that Jesus is who he said he was. Jesus compares, or Peter compares Jesus to David because they were still waiting for that Davidic king, their Messiah, to come and overthrow Rome. Even the disciples just 10 days ago asked Jesus that he had come to do that. But now the Holy Spirit has come and their hearts have been opened to the truth that Jesus, they understand Jesus why, why Jesus came. See, I like to think of myself as a logical person. And when people use my own logic against me, that's kind of hard for me to swallow sometimes. Peter did the same to the crowd. He told them the Messiah had, they had been expecting and showed them that Jesus is that Messiah. And for that Messiah, was God, the one God sent to Israel was the one they crucified just weeks ago. And so I think that even Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, I think people are still talking about that. It was still a story being circulated throughout Jerusalem of this Jesus who came and preached and died, and then his body disappeared, so he must have done something. I think they still had um, that news in Jerusalem. They still spoke about the empty tomb and the rumors of Jesus appearing to people. And, and so just because Jesus was absent doesn't mean the people didn't talk about him. And, and so Peter lays out this beautiful sermon, this beautiful illustration of God was in the beginning, Jesus was chosen, he fulfilled that scripture from Joel that Peter talked about, and he came and they killed him for that. The Messiah was here and they had killed him. And let's see how the people respond to that in verses 37 to 41. It says, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, re replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the Holy Spirit of God. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, all for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many of the words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So when the crowd heard Peter's sermon, it says they were cut to the heart or cut to the quick. And, and no, this isn't just a slight pain. It's an indication of a sudden and overwhelming weight or pain, almost an oppression upon these people when they heard what they had done. They were crushed by, by what they had done and were uncertain how to respond. They wanted to fix it, but didn't know what to do. And so when people are confronted with their sin and the incomparable grace Jesus offers, they're often in the same boat. They're not sure how to respond. Uh, they need help. And Peter tells the people to do two things. First, repent and then be baptized. So we have to be sorry enough to recognize our sin and sorry enough to stop the sin. Not simply be sorry because we were caught, 
but truly repenting to turn around and to go the other direction, to run away from that sin, to truly be different. The next step was to make that public declaration of faith, that baptism. Um, and then Peter says that it's a, you know, like we discussed last week, it's not only a confession, but it's a um, sealing of who they belong to, that they belong to Jesus. It's a confession that not only am I a sinner, but I belong to Jesus in this process. And so as a result of that second confession, the believers then would receive the Holy Spirit. And that was promised to them and their children and all who are far off from God, all those that God called himself. This means that in that single day after Peter preached, um, and it says he wasn't done preaching after what we read, but he continued to preach and continued to admonish the people. The church went from about 120 in verse 15 of chapter 1 to over 3,120. It says over 3,000 were added to their number that day. Folks, that's a 26-fold increase in one day. Now, I'm not saying if we go start preaching on the corners that that'll happen to us, but I am convinced that people still will respond to the gospel when it's presented. They will still recognize that God is still knocking on their heart and still working in their lives. And when we have the opportunity to present the gospel, people will respond to that. So reading the last little bit of this chapter, verses 42 to 47, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions, and good they gave to anyone he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So now the church has had a 26-fold increase. Now they've got to figure out what to do with these folks. Um, they needed help integrating into the followers of Jesus, that 120. And recall some of those followers, 120, had been with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry, so the last three years. And now they just added 3,000 more people to the group and more coming each day. And I can tell you that whenever two people are gathered, there's at least three different opinions. So how are the apostles going to handle this crowd? How are they going to ensure that the church is on the same page? Well, we read that they met daily. They devoted themselves to four things. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. You know, recall at the end of chapter 1, those early church, that 120, was together and praying together. Now the church is much bigger, and it's still doing the same thing. They're still meeting together, praying together, fellowshipping together, sharing all they have as any has need. They're being of unity and purpose. So as the apostles share about the teaching of Jesus, the group is sharing what they had, staying in community, and they're praying together. I've said it before, I don't think there's any greater organization on this earth than the church of Jesus. When hardships come, and then we all know they will come, um, we need each other more and more. And we need to stay together, stay sharing together and carrying one another's burdens. That's what the early church did. That's what this passage in Acts, the last part of this chapter, that's what it really shows is that this is the culmination of all that Jesus came to do, folks. When we went through the book of John and now the first couple chapters of Acts. This is what Jesus came to do, to, to establish that church so his message can spread throughout the world. They stayed and they continued in that command of Jesus to be his witnesses to all people. So this is really the culmination of Jesus' ministry. We like to think that the culmination of Jesus is that personal salvation, and that's a huge thing and should not be downplayed whatsoever. But really the culmination of Jesus' ministry is the church taking on that, that responsibility to spread, to spread the gospel. It's when believers come together and sacrifice to help somebody else, when we share and pray for each other, when we devote ourselves to the word and seeing ourselves grow spiritually and seeing others grow spiritually. This is the culmination of what Jesus came to do. Not to save us from our sins, but to save us into fellowship with God and with each other. And so as we've seen over the last few weeks, the last few months actually, we've seen Jesus begin his ministry. We've seen him teach others. We've seen him rebuke and correct other people and how we see him ascend and send the Holy Spirit so that the church can be the church one of the greatest blessings on this earth to others that are involved with it. So I pray that as we go this week, we would have that same conviction, that same desire to be involved with what others, go, what others are going through, to be involved with people around us. Lord, we thank you for today and this time. God, I thank you for your example in the book of Acts, Lord. God, the example of the other church coming together, praying together, being devoted to teaching, being of unity of purpose, sharing what they had, and just being 
of fellowship, Lord, being brothers and sisters in your family, Lord. And God, I thank you that I can be a part of that here. And I pray that as I join this local church, God, and as I engage in this local church, Lord, you would equip me to better share your message outside these walls. Lord, we thank you for today. And we ask that you continue to give us that desire, motivation, and encouragement, Lord, to share your message of love, hope, and salvation with all we meet. Father, we love you. We thank you for today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as usual, folks, so, thank you so much for joining me. So glad you did. Uh, next week, we're going to jump into our Advent study. Uh, believe it or not, it's time for that. So next week will be the first Sunday of Advent, and we'll go through that the next four weeks. So hope you have a great day. Thank you so much for joining me. Remember that God loves you, and we're a blessed people.